All right, so video two is just going to follow up a little bit um, with calculations associated with energy. Specifically, we're going to focus on changes in state. This one's going to be a little bit shorter and sweeter. When we are dealing with changes of state, we have changes of potential energy, and we have, um, well, those are the only changes you have associated with your change in state is potential energy. And because of that, your temperature isn't changing. Temperature is a change in kinetic energy. So when we are calculating changes associated with state, our equation is going to be a little bit different. Um, we are going to use um, a different physical property, the enthalpy or the heat of fusion, and the enthalpy or heat of vaporization. And this basically is telling us how much heat gets transferred as a gram of that substance or a mole of that substance changes state as it's going from between the solid and liquid state or the liquid and gas state. Now, when you are going through an endothermic process like melting, that value is gonna be positive. If we were going to be looking at a substance undergoing freezing, um, it would be called the heat of crystallization um, and it'd be delta H of CRY or whatever you wanna call it. And the value would be the same as the delta H of fusion. It would just be negative because the same temperature you melt at is the temperature that you would freeze at. And um, for heat of vaporization, um, that's going from a liquid to a gas, so your delta H would have a positive component because it was an endothermic process. Energy is needed to be added to make water boil. And if you were going to condense water, you would have a heat of condensation or an enthalpy of condensation, and the delta H of condensation would be the same as the vaporization value, but it would just be negative um, since you are letting go of energy. Um, when you're calculating the heat associated with the phase change, you don't want to include temperature because since temperature is constant, your delta T would be zero, and then that would be telling you that there's no heat involved in that process, um, which we know is definitely not the case. You definitely need heat to undergo um, phase changes, whether it's through gaining it or losing it. Um, while we're changing state, oftentimes these are going to be associated with temperature changes, um, and those are associated with kinetic energy, since the molecules are either moving more quickly or more slowly. Um, so we still will be using MCP delta T. Um, we just kind of have to look at what information we're given in our problem to know how many phase changes we've gone through and how many um, states we've gone through, um, and then what temperatures we were at when we were going through those state changes. So if you were going to take a substance from its solid state all the way up to its vapor state, you would have Q calculations for the three phases, solid, liquid, and gas, as well as the two phase changes that your substance underwent, um, the melting Q as well as the boiling Q. Again, you're not going to necessarily have all of these, um, but these are the different ones that you could have involved, both potential energy changes as well as kin um, kinetic energy changes. So if I was going to represent this graphically, um, specifically with water, we can see how ice is going to be a solid below zero, and then there's going to be a flat line where it's undergoing a potential energy change as the melting process is occurring. And then I have a sharp increase as I apply heat and that water warms up. Eventually, we're going to reach a point where the water is going to turn into steam. You'll notice that the line for that is much longer than it was from ice to water. Um, that's because you have a lot of intermolecular forces to overcome. And so the delta H for boiling for water is substantially greater than the delta H of fusion where ice is melting. Uh, because that's a larger quantity, it's going to require a heck of a lot more um, heat to be able to change all the water into steam. And then once you get um, all of it converted over, then you go back into just purely steam being warmed up and you can see the temperature changing there. Again, you won't necessarily have all five of these particular changes taking place for a given substance. You kind of have to look at their melting point and boiling point. What temperature do they start at? What temperature do they end at? Um, to know which components you need to include. 
Now this is for heating of ice to steam. If I was going to go in the reverse direction, the graph would literally be the mirror image. You would see the steam cooling down. You would see the long line again as the steam condenses into water. You would see the temperature drop again as um, the water keeps cooling down. And then eventually you would see it a much more abbreviated horizontal line um, where the water is freezing and then it would be ice below zero degrees. So we are going to do one involving all five, but I just wanted to caution you that I, I'm pretty sure on your homework you're probably going to have ones that don't necessarily have all five. Um, we're going to take 25 grams of ice at negative 25 degrees Celsius, and we're going to turn it into steam at 115 degrees Celsius. So if we take that graph that I showed you before, um, we know that water is going to freeze. Um, sorry, I went ahead and labeled the states first. So the slope lines are your states. That's where your temperature changes, your kinetic energy changes are happening, your solid, your liquid, and your gas. And then your phase changes are the plateaus um, when you have your potential energy changing. Those phase changes are going to occur, sorry, went too fast, at zero degrees Celsius for solid to liquid and 100 degrees Celsius for liquid to gas. Um, so when we think about the calculations we're going to be doing um, for this ice, remember that we're starting at negative 25, so below zero, and we're going up to 115 past 100. The quantities on the right, temperature change, CP values for the different states of water, and the delta H quantities for phase changes, those are constant. I don't expect you to know those values. If you need them to solve for a problem, they will be provided for you. Um, you might have to decide which ones you need, um, so just be aware of that. The only other way you would um, have to solve for one of those, it would be like what we did initially, where you were given the Q and you were given M, or information about Q and M and delta T, and you solve for CP. Um, but in a problem like this, when we're solving for energy, you don't have to worry about it. They will be provided for you, although, again, you might have to decide which ones you need to use. So with this problem, again, we're um, the two phases, sorry, the two temperatures that we know where phase changes are occurring are 0 degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius. We know that ice is going to freeze at negative 25 and, or sorry, I am, it's been a long day, um, that this substance is starting at negative 25 degrees Celsius and it's ending at 115. And I meant for the um, CP values and the delta H values to pop up, but I forgot to change the order of the animations. They're not going to show up until the end. Um, you have the previous slide to kind of use as a reference for where I'm getting these values from. But we, if we look at this graph, and you don't have to make it um, on your um, practice problems. Um, this is just kind of there for you as a reference as to what I'm doing. We have all five parts of the graph are included in our temperature range from negative 25 to 115. So that means I'm going to need an equation for the ice warming up. So that's going to be from negative 25 to 0. So that's a temperature change, MCP delta T. All of the M's are going to be 25 grams. The CP for this particular part of the graph is going to be for ice, which is 2.06. And I went through a temperature change from negative 25 to 0, so 25 degrees Celsius. And because that is a temperature change, that's the same as saying 25 Kelvin. And my flat line at 0 degrees, I'm making ice melt. So I would need to include its mass, the M delta H, but specifically the delta H for that melting process, which is 333 for water. Again, if you look at the previous slide, you'll see that there. Now I'm warming up my water. I'm going from 0 to 100 degrees Celsius. And so anytime I'm on one of those sloped lines, when I'm going through temperature changes, I need to use MCP delta T. I have my mass. I have my CP for water. And then my temperature change is a temperature change where I'm in that middle slope line between 0 and 100 degrees Celsius. I now have my last flat line where I'm changing from liquid to gas, potential energy changes. So I need to use M delta H, but specifically the delta H 
for few, um, vaporization where I change from liquid to gas, that will be 2260. And then finally, I'm going to take um, my water and I'm going to, uh, sorry, my water vapor, and I'm going to heat it up to 115 degrees Celsius, but I was only a vapor starting at 100 degrees Celsius. So my temperature change this time is going to be 15. I need to use the heat capacity for water as a gas, which is 1.86. And again, I keep my mass 25 grams. So remember your um, sig fig rules that you multiply and then you add. Um, you need to make sure you account for your sig figs for the multiplication part before you can add all your values together. Um, the most these can all have is two sig figs, so the mass only has two sig figs. Um, all the CP values and delta H's have more than two sig figs. Um, you have two temperature changes with two sig figs, but you don't have any with one. So all of your quantities are going to need to have um, two sig figs when you multiply the five quantities together. So the units all cancel out, the grams, the Kelvin. And so 1300 was my first quantity for the ice melting, um, or the ice warming, excuse me. 8300 was when the ice changed to a liquid when it was melted. The 10,000 was when the water was being warmed up because the 10,000 needs to have two sig figs. You can either put a line over the first zero or you could write it in notation form. Our, um, the 57,000 is from the water boiling, going from a liquid to a gas. And then the final quantity is the vapor being heated to 115 degrees Celsius. Um, that one needs to have two sig figs as well. So 700 would have a line over the first zero. So all I have left to do is to add these quantities together. I need to see which place that all five quantities have in common. Um, so what is the least precise measurement that I have? Um, or my least precise calculation. My first measurement can is reported to the hundreds place. My second calculation, sorry, not measurement calculation, is reported to the hundreds place. My third calculation is only reported to the thousands place. My fourth calculation is also only reported to the thousands place. And my fifth calculation is reported to the tens place. So the most precise I can be with my answer is to the thousands place. So when I add all these together, I'm going to need to round to the thousands place. And when I do that, I get 77,000. So again, I'm sorry I didn't have these pop up initially. There's your CP values. There's your delta H values. So you can see where I got the 2.06 for ice, the 4.184 for water, and the 1.86 for steam. And then for the melting process, the 333, and for vaporization, the 2260.